Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. Happy New Year 2023. Today, I wanted to give a little chat about the amorphous blob that is the year to come in the world of classical music recordings. Let me explain to you exactly what I mean by amorphous blob. When I started writing criticism back in the 1980s, there were these interesting objects out there. They were physical objects. They were called magazines. Magazines had circulation. You could buy them on newsstands or you could subscribe to them. And they all vanished. They all vanished by, you know, the, the late 80s or 90s. Most of them were gone. There are some still um, physical things out there. There's like gramophone and fanfare and some others, I believe. But most of these things have become online vehicles, as we all had to. And the reason is because the, the market for physical product self-destructed. In the United States, and I can only talk about the United States with real knowledge, it became impossible for audio magazines, and they were audio and, and recordings. They were high fidelity, stereo review, you know, the popular magazines to survive because it was simply too expensive. It was too expensive to get newsstand distribution. You had to have national coverage, which meant you had to print tens of thousands of copies that would be sent to newsstands, and if they didn't sell, they'd be sent back and you had to get advertising to support that. And there was a brief period where audio manufacturers, of course, audio manufacturers are a separate world, but the record labels actually paid for advertising that covered the cost of basically getting the thing out there. Never mind what people paid when they actually bought it. And that vanished. It dried up and disappeared. And when it dried up and disappeared, so did the magazines. That was the end of them. They could not afford to have that kind of circulation. And everything moved more or less to the Internet. The classical music labels also moved to the Internet. But one of the things those magazines had, um, and I was just looking at this. I, I'm going to give you some samples of it. I was looking at the 1987 September issue of High Fidelity magazine, which I was writing for at the time. Um, and the September issue was given over entirely to the year's upcoming releases. Now, the, the release schedule was a monthly one for labels. It still is for some stupid reason, even though nobody has like physical product in stores anymore. It really doesn't matter. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the, the year began in the fall with fall releases and went to the following fall. That was basically the time period in question. And the major magazines, High Fidelity being one, Gramophone being another, always printed a upcoming year's releases schedule. This was fabulous. This was just fabulous. Why? Because it allowed collectors such as myself and many of you, who I'm sure remember this, the opportunity to see what was coming out and plan your purchases and actually look forward to something and be on top of it and buy them when they arrived. And you know, now everything is just, well, you don't know when it's going to show up and it shows up at different times in different places. And if it does show up, you don't know what it's going to cost and you don't know where it's coming from. And it, it, it's completely nuts. And, and you have no clue what's coming. Certain releases, certain major releases do get some advanced press. But what's happened? Well, uh, we'll talk about what's happened as we look at a little sample here. I'm going to pull up, if you give me a moment. There it is. The fabulous issue, the September 1987 issue of High Fidelity magazine, which I have in PDF format. And I'm just looking at a couple labels. First, let's look at a major label. I, I, I got London Records. London, of course, became DECA. London always was DECA. London was the U.S. version of DECA. But here it is. And let's look at, let's look at what's coming out. New releases and reissues um, for well, most of the coming year. And, I, you know, they weren't complete, these lists. They were, they were just the highlights. But this issue, I will tell you, says that it has a list of 963 or 900 and some odd classical new releases upcoming. Think of that, 900 and some odd. Think of what that is every month. That's a lot of stuff on a lot of labels. And this is 1987. The classical music industry does not release less product now. 
We just have no idea what it is and what it's going to be and why. It's insane. So what do we have? Let's look here. We have Adam Giselle with, with Richard Bonning. We have Albania's Iberia, the digital recording with Alicia de la Rocha. We have Bach, Viola de Gamba sonatas arranged for cello with Lynn, Lynn Harrell and Igor Kipnis. And Beethoven cello sonatas with Lynn Harrell. He was busy back then. And Vladimir Ashkenazi. Um, we've got, oh, Beethoven's Last Symphony. I don't have my tie with me. You know which one it is. The last one was Schulte in Chicago, his digital one. Bellini's Norma with Sutherland, Pavarotti, and Caballé. Chopin Ballades and, and the Fantasy with, let's see, who else is who's doing this? And F minor Barcarolle with Jorge Bolet. There you go. The Dvorak Piano Concerto and the Schumann Concertstück with, with Andra Schiff and Dohnani with the Vienna Philharmonic. Giuliani Guitar Concertos with some guitar person, Fernandez and the English Chamber Orchestra. Handel, Grand Choruses from Messiah. That's also with Chicago and Schulte. Haydn Symphonies 93 and 99 with the London Philharmonic and Schulte. Lerner and Lowe, My Fair Lady with Curie Takanawa, Jerry Hadley, and John Mocheri conducting the Mahler 10 with the Berlin Radio Symphony Orchestra and Shai. He was a newcomer back then. Remember when that came out? It was one of the great Mahler 10s. It still is. Massenet, Manon Ballet with Bonning. Uh, Mendelssohn's Songs Without Words with Andras Schiff. Mussorgsky. Pictures in an Exhibition and a Night on Bald Mountain, the Montreal Symphony and Dutrois. Rachmaninoff, Piano Concerto One, Paganini Rhapsody with Ashkenazi and Heitink. Richard Strauss's Arabella with Curie Ticanoa. Uh, and Jeffrey Tate conducting Stravinsky's Pulcinella, Song of the Nightingale with Montreal and Dutrois. Tchaikovsky, Piano Concerto Number no. One and Rachmaninoff Number no. Two with Jorge Bolet, Montreal Symphony and Dutrois. Villa Lobos, piano music with Christina Ortiz, and Wagner Lohengrin with Domingo, Norman, and Schulte, then some other things. Now that's new releases. Then we have reissues. We have Bach, uh, let's see, it was this Bach organ concertos with Peter Herford. I don't remember what that was. Beethoven, uh, middle middle period piano sonatas with Ashkenazi. It was a new cycle then, sort of. Bellini, well, it's a new reissue anyway. Bellini e Puritani with Pavarotti and Sutherland and Bonning. Berg's Wozzeck with Anya Silia and Dohnani. Brahms piano pieces with, with Radu Lupu. These are reissues, remember. Um, I, I'm just going to skip through these. I don't want to make a whole huge to-do about it, but the Britain Beggars Opera highlights. Britain's Billy Budd, conducted by Britain. Bruckner Five, the Chicago and Schulte. Chopin Complete Piano Works with Ashkenazi. That was a big deal coming out on CD. Uh, Debussy Preludes. It doesn't say who it's with. Um, Chopin Les Sylphides with Bonning. Uh, Dvorak Symphony 789, the Cleveland Orchestra Dohnani digital recordings that were stuck as a as a twofer. Here where they were on two discs. Um, let's see. Elgar, Pomp and Circumstance Marches with Schulte, the Frock String Quartet with the Fitzwilliam Quartet, Gluck's Orfeo with Schulte and Marilyn Horn. Mussorgsky Pictures in an Exhibition with Schulte, Ravel, Daftis, and Chloe, Suite Number 2, and other goodies with Montreal and Dutrois. Um, Rossini Overtures with Shai, Stravinsky, The Firebird, The Red of Spring, and Petrushka, The Detroit Symphony, Antal Dorati, reissued already as a twofer. Um, Tchaikovsky, Eugene Onegin with Schulte, Tippett, Concerto for Double String Orchestra, and other stuff with Mariner and the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields, and Verdi, Louisa Miller with Pavarotti and Caballé and Milnes. Okay, that's just London. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of stuff that was happening. But one of the things I'd like you to note, and I'm not even dealing with independent labels. I mean, they were they were going like gangbusters too. I've got some here, but we don't have, we don't have to go through the whole list. Let me just make the point. The point is that the major labels at that point, at this time, had projects. They had major artists. Those major artists had recording programs. Those programs consisted of series, Tchaikovsky cycles, Stravinsky ballets, all that stuff. Nowadays, the major labels don't do any of that. They make stupid little recital discs with hotsy-totsy youngsters. That's what they're basically doing. And there's very little else 
that's going on from major labels. Independent labels always had their own rosters and their own things and interesting repertoire and up and coming artists and all the usual stuff. And they still do. But the problem is this. We don't get informed as to what's coming. Nobody tells us anymore. And that is the most obvious lacuna in the world of classical music today, because we need to know when thousands of things come out, what, what we're, what we're going to buy. And it's insane. It's ridiculous that there is no vehicle for the classical music industry simply to advise people what's coming. It's the most basic, essential form of advertising, just telling people what you have and what's coming. And nobody does it anymore. I mean, you might say they do it after a fashion. What they do is everybody has their own website. Some of those websites are well-maintained. Some of them are not. Most of them are crap. Most of them are useless, especially the ones from the major labels, as regards helpful information about what they're doing and when internationally. It's, it's an amorphous blob. That's the point. And this amorphous blob is becoming more blobular by the minute. And I find it aggravating beyond belief. It was so exciting to get the fall issues of Gramophone or High Fidelity or any of these magazines that had these huge lists of all the stuff, all of the stuff that the classical music industry was doing. Why is there no organ or organization representing the industry, a trade organization that simply collects data and puts it all in one spot, collates it and issues it once a year. That's all we need. That's all we need. And then follows through. I mean, the labels, of course, have to do what they say they're going to do. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But you get the picture, right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Because then we could all have a conversation. The community of of listeners and collectors would once again be able to enjoy the same things at the same time and discuss them and create a buzz. It would all happen by word of mouth. It wouldn't cost a nickel, but no, there's none of that now. Everything is its own little piece, its own little website, its own little individual niche. And sometimes there's physical products. Sometimes there isn't. Sometimes it's, you know, I don't need to tell you. I don't need to tell you how insane it is. But going back and looking at these old issues of magazines, it makes us realize just how how wonderful it was when we actually knew. And uh, that was that was a time. And so as we look forward to 2023, to this amorphous blob of musical activity um, that is just going to happen at some point, and we are always catching up to what's going on and trying to figure out how to find things and where to get them and who's doing them. And uh, well, that's, that's the industry today. And it's, it's unspeakably frustrating and absolutely ridiculous. And so completely non, you know, people talk about commercial, commercial interest, the industry, you know, as if it's capitalism. I mean, I've seen it in my comments, you know, these socialist nutcase people who think that there's some sort of military industrial complex doing this. What a bunch of boobs they are, if that's true. Could anyone be less competent, less capitalistic, less mercenary than the classical music business is now as regards how it addresses the consumer? I don't think so. I really don't think so. So have a wonderful new year and let's look forward to whatever the hell happens and see what we can make of it. That's the best we can do. Keep on listening, friends. Take care.